evening, everyone, and welcome to the Ford Presidential Library. My name is Elaine Didier, and it's my privilege to serve as director of the library here in Ann Arbor and the museum in Grand Rapids. We're very happy to have you with us for our second program of the fall. Tonight's program, as you can see, is being taped by Michigan Productions for later broadcast on Ann Arbor Cable. Uh, when we get to the Q&A session of the program, we would appreciate it if you go to the microphone at the center of the, at the back of the center aisle to ask your questions so that everyone who sees the program in future will be able to hear the whole conversation. And finally, the standard bit of housekeeping, please turn off your cell phones and other electronic devices before we start the program. Tonight's program is brought to you by the National Archives and Records Administration, our parent organization, with additional and essential support from the Ford Presidential Foundation. We are very grateful for members of Friends of Ford and donors to the foundation for their ongoing support for our educational programs, research travel grants for scholars, and programs like this one. Tonight we have the distinct honor of hosting John Miller, an accomplished journalist, author, and academic who will discuss college football in its infancy based on his recent book, The Big Scrum, How Teddy Roosevelt Saved Football. We'll have a test at the end of the program to find out if any of you knew that Teddy Roosevelt had single-handedly saved football. Mr. Miller spoke at the Ford Museum in the winter of 2011, and his program was so well received that we wanted to have him speak here in Ann Arbor. And how appropriate that this event is just after another University of Michigan football victory, during which it just happens that President Ford's number 48 jersey was unretired. He is now truly a Michigan legend. And for those of you who sat through the rain and the cold, I, my commiseration. <laughs> a native of Michigan and then Florida, John Miller began his journalism career while still in high school. He'd broken his finger during competitive tryouts for basketball and couldn't continue on the team. So he joined the staff of the school newspaper instead and loved every aspect of the work. Later, he majored in English here at the university and became editor-in-chief of the Michigan Review, an independent conservative student newspaper. After graduation, his first job was at the New Republic in Washington, and in 1998, he joined the staff of National Review, where he was named the national political reporter. Mr. Miller is the author of five books on very diverse topics. While in Washington, he wrote his first book, The Unmaking of Americans, How Multiculturalism Has Undermined the Assimilation Ethic. In 2004, he co-authored Our Oldest Enemy, A History of America's Disastrous Relationship with France. I'm personally very keenly interested in that one. His first novel came in 2009, The First Assassin, is a historical thriller set in 1861 Washington when the United States was on the brink of civil war. In 2011, The Big Scrum was released and it received rave reviews. It is an intriguing story of how Teddy Roosevelt helped save the game that would become America's most popular sport. Doing so required taking on none other than Charles Eliot, the president of Harvard, who wanted to abolish the game due to the high number of injuries to players. As a result of all of his achievements in writing, the Chronicle of Higher Ed has called John Miller one of the best literary journalists in the country. Currently, he is a director of the Herbert H. Dow Journalism Program at Hillsdale College here in Michigan, where he teaches and oversees the school newspaper and shares his experience and passion with a new generation of budding journalists. He remains a practicing journalist, however, still on the masthead of National Review and writes for many other publications, including the Wall Street Journal. He has hinted that there are new books on the horizon but will not yet reveal the ideas, so we'll have to stay tuned. Please welcome John Miller to talk about football. Thank you. All right, guys, we got a big game on Saturday. Who's, uh, who's going to that? All right, quite a few of you, excellent. I'm really looking forward to it, but the game also saddens me a little bit because it, it, it splits our state in two. You know, there's, you, you go to the mall, you've seen, the, you've seen those stores called the Great Divide, you know, where half of it's maize and blue, the other is, half of it is, is green and white, and you just sort of see how this can tear families apart, and husbands and wives with these uh, intermarriages and so forth, and how hard this can be on families. You know, we're, we're, in, we're, uh, we're three weeks away from a, from a presidential election, 
a bitter, hard-fought presidential election is pulling our country in two with Republican red and Democrat uh, blue uh, really tearing us apart. And I think it's important to remember, at bottom, we're really all Americans, aren't we? Well, with this game on Saturday, I think it's important to remember that we all share something in common as well. Every U of M student and alumnus and every MSU student and alumnus share something in common. And that's that all, all of us at one point received an acceptance letter from Michigan State University. <laughs> now, I'm not, I'm not trying, you know, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to just tell a bunch of cheap jokes about Michigan State up here. If I wanted to tell a bunch of cheap jokes about Michigan State, I would point out that their mascot wears a dress. But I'm not going to do that tonight. In fact, a lot of great things have come out of East Lansing. A lot of great things. For instance, I-69. <laughs> Folks, I can do this all night. <laughs> now, I'll segue into football with, with one more joke, if you'll, uh, if you'll indulge me. A guy walks into a bar. He says, bartender, did you hear the joke about Michigan State? What he didn't notice is that the offensive line of Michigan State was the table right next to him. And these four guys, these four huge Goliaths of men, stand up and, 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 and circle him at the bar. And, and they say, and they say, you going to tell a joke about Michigan State University? And the guy says, looks at him, you know, like they're towering above him. He looks around and says, no, I'm not going to tell a don't joke about Michigan State University. I'd have to explain it four times. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about football and Theodore Roosevelt. I want to start with a statistic. It's the, stati it's the statistic that got me to write this book, in fact. In 1905, 18 people died playing football. In 1905, 18 people died playing football. Now, we're hearing a lot in the news today about concussions, about the long-term health effects of head injuries. This is a big controversy in football. The only thing bigger was the replacement of refs, I guess, right? And now that's settled. So we're back to this, this being the biggest off-the-field controversy in football. And it has been for a couple years now, and it will be for a few more years. But it's got nothing on the debate they were having a little more than a century ago. So let's go back in time and, 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 and look at that, that era. On November 18, 1876, Theodore Roosevelt attended his first football game. He had just turned 18 years old. He was a freshman at Harvard, got on the train with about 70 friends, and they went down to New Haven, where they watched the second ever football game played between Harvard and Yale. Now, Alabama has Auburn. Army has Navy, Michigan has Ohio, as I gather we're now supposed to call it. <laughs> well, Harvard and Yale have each other. And on that day in 1876, they played for only the second time. The weather was lousy, the skies were overcast, the wind was blowing in so hard in gusts that ships couldn't leave the harbor. It was a nasty day. And as Roosevelt shivered watching this game, one that was, it was quite different from the sport we know today. There were no quarterbacks. There were no wide receivers. There were no first downs. There were no forward passes. Football was in its infancy. And before play began, the captains from the two teams met at the middle of the field. And they were like school kids, deciding uh, where out of bounds would be, how would you count blitzes, uh, so on and so forth. When it came to football, Harvard was the teacher and Yale was the student. Just a few days before that game in 1876, Harvard mailed Yale the ball that they would be using for the game. Uh, Yale had been practicing with, with a spherical ball, like a, like, a, like a soccer ball. That's what they'd been preparing with. And then this new ball shows up, and it's like a watermelon. And they, the, the players at Yale didn't know what to do with it. How do you kick this thing? Do you kick it on the end? Do you kick it on the side? What do you do? They didn't know. Yale, they had, to they had to debate these fundamentals, figure out how you punt this thing, just figure out the basics of this game. Now, before the play started, Harvard's 
captains accepted a couple of proposals that the Yale players put forward. One would have a lasting legacy on the game, the other would not, but it would matter that afternoon. The first proposal that Yale put forward is that, is that they would play 11 men to a side. Up until that point, it had been the custom to play 15 men to a side in football. Well, that day they played 11 men to the side. It was the first time that had been done. That, of course, remained the case. The second suggestion would not shape the future of the sport, but it would, matter that, it would matter that afternoon. They decided that touchdowns would not count for points, but the point after attempt would. <laughs> so, so touchdowns wouldn't count, but, the, but they, would give it, they would earn you the right to kick up for a point and also a kick from the field, like a field goal, essentially. That would be worth a point as well. That's how you would score that afternoon. The, uh, the uprights, they, 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 they planted a couple of poles and tied a rope between them. And that was the goalpost. So in the first half, Harvard scores a touchdown, but it missed the kick. So at halftime, the score was nothing, nothing. After the break, Yale pushed into Harvard territory, and a lanky freshman named Walter Camp, a name you may have heard before, Walter Camp got the ball, and he turned around and made this bad lateral pass to a player behind him. The ball hit the ground. It took one of those funny hops that footballs do, kind of out of control. And the guy behind him, a fellow named Walt, uh, Oliver Thompson, thought he saw an opportunity. And he put his foot to the ball and booted it. And from this wide angle, from 35 yards out, the football improbably sailed through the uprights. So it's one point Yale. And that's how the game ended. One nothing Yale. Harvard's loss frustrated Roosevelt. In a letter to his mother the next day, he didn't say whether he enjoyed himself as he huddled in the cold with his friends and watched a football game for the first time. The future president had no inkling of football's eventual popularity, nor could he have anticipated the crucial role he would play in its development. But he did give voice to the frustration that so often accompanies the agony of defeat. I am sorry to say we were beaten, he wrote, principally because our opponents played very foul. <laughs> now in a moment I'll talk more about Teddy Roosevelt and what he did for football. But I want to say a few words about why football matters, both to me personally and to Americans generally. I met my wife on the way to a football game here in Ann Arbor, walking from Markley to the stadium. That's at least my first clear memory of her. She doesn't remember me. <laughs> And we didn't start dating until basketball season. But right after graduation, we got engaged in the Diag. And years before we were joined in matrimony, we shared this love for the maize and blue. Now, my romance with college football goes back even, even further. I grew up in one of these homes where I could sing Hail to the Victors when I was three years old. And in my family, the Carter era is not a reference to a troubled presidency in the <laughs> 1970s, but a time when Anthony Carter wore a winged helmet and caught touchdown passes on under the, under the coaching of, 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 of Bo Schembechler of sainted memory. My first, it's, when I first started attending Michigan football games as a student, I came to realize these are more than just athletic competitions. These are, these are cultural rituals, cultural rituals of deep significance. They not only unite a diverse campus of engineering students and English majors, but they also create a community of fans across a region and beyond. Michigan fans can be can be black or white, they can be young or old, they can be lunch bucket union guys or auto company executives, uh, they can be uh, alumni or grammar school dropouts. Conversations about the team are social icebreakers, a way to form bonds between fathers and sons, colleagues at work, strangers at parties. And my marriage is certainly not the only one that owes a debt to the game. Now love for a college football team, whether it's the Texas Longhorns or the Hillsdale Chargers, is almost tribal. In some cases, such as my own, the affiliation is practically inherited. In other, time, in other cases, it's, it's, it's chosen. But whatever the origin, it forms lifelong passions. I still get chills thinking about the sound of the marching band when it plays our fight song as it takes the field. The sensation is a close cousin to patriotism. And on brisk autumn afternoons, my three main allegiances are to God, family, and football, Michigan football. And let's face it. Objectively speaking, football is an awesome sport. No other game has such a combination of brute force and pure grace. 
99 yard touchdown sprints and goal line stands. The careful choreography of a well executed play involving 11 men, crashing bodies at the line of scrimmage, the infantry combat of a rushing assault, the air war of a passing attack. Football has it all. There's a strong intellectual dimension as well. Ba baseball has its reputation as, as the cerebral sport, the sport of intellectuals. George Will writes columns about it, things like that. But no sport, no sport demands more meticulous planning or quick calculation than football. This is a pursuit not just for players and the fans who cheer them on, but for the coaches and the armchair generals who second guess every move. Little wonder that football has become the most popular sport in the United States, and by a lot. With thousands of kids who play under Friday night lights, millions who gather on Saturday afternoons or watch games on Sundays or Monday nights, uh, Americans are probably more likely to know their favorite team's quarterback than the name of their congressman. And, uh, and, and, and chances, are, and, and, you, and you could say they have their priorities straight. <laughs> so, so football occupies a central place in our lives. Yet there was a moment when football almost was taken away from us. A time when its very existence was in mortal peril. As a collection of progressive era politicians, prohibitionists really, tried to ban the game. They objected to its violence, and their favorite solution was to smother this sport in its cradle. Had the enemies of football gotten their way, they might have erased one of America's great cultural pastimes. It took the remarkable efforts of Theodore Roosevelt, one of America's most extraordinary men, to thwart them. Now, we've, we've heard about these modern controversies over football and the violence in it. Congress has held hearings on football concussions. Uh, last year, Time Magazine put a deflated football on its cover and asked in its article whether the sport was, quote, too dangerous for its own good. Then there's that statistic I shared a moment ago. In 1905, a year of momentous importance for the sport, in 1905, 18 people died playing football. The sad thing about this stat is that it was not unusual. In fact, it was typical. It was just another year for football. In those days, a dozen or more people would die playing the sport routinely. Many more suffered bad injuries. A lot of the casualties were kids in sandlot games, but the injuries and, and, and fatalities ranged all the way up to big-time college football. Uh, there was no professional football then. Uh, players at the University of Georgia, the University of Virginia, Union College, the military academies at West Point and Annapolis, they all died playing. Football is not a contact sport, it's a collision sport that has always prized size, strength, and power. And this was especially true in its early years. Quirks in the rules compressed the game's action to a small part of the field rather than spread it across a large area. Big men crashed and pushed and shoved into each other all day long around masses of bodies they, they, as they grappled for the ball without benefit of protective gear. The era of the leatherheads lay in the future. They wore no shoulder pads, no helmets, no face masks, almost nothing. During the frequent pileups, hidden from view of the referees, players would throw elbows, punch each other in the face. The worst of them would try and gouge eyeballs in these big piles. Bruises, sprains, other minor injuries were taken for, for granted. More serious impairments, such as cracked bones and knocked heads, were causes of greater concern, but also generally accepted as the unfortunate byproducts of a demanding and entertaining sport. The deaths, however, were the worst. They were not freak accidents as much as the inevitable toll of an activity that encouraged strong men to crash into each other again and again across an afternoon. An ordinary tackle could become a life-threatening calamity when the, when the knee of a, of a tackler hits the head of a ball carrier, a guy who's not wearing a helmet. This horrified a group of activists who crusaded against football. They wanted not merely to remove violence from the sport, but to ban it altogether. At the dawn of the progressive era, the prohibition of football became a social and political movement whose most, outspo whose most outspoken proponents included Harvard University President Charles W. Eliot, the, the frontier scholar at the University of Wisconsin, Frederick Jackson Turner, muckraking journalists, and even the aging Confederate General John Mosby united in this, in this social and political movement to ban football. The New York Evening Post attacked the sport. So did The Nation, an influential magazine of, of news and opinion both then and now. It worried that colleges were becoming, quote, 
huge training grounds for young gladiators, around whom as many spectators roar as roared in the Roman amphitheater, unquote. The New York Times bemoaned football's trend toward mayhem and homicide. About two weeks after printing these words, the Times ran a new editorial. The headline was, Two Curable Evils. The first evil it addressed was lynching of blacks. The second evil was football. The main figure in this movement to bad football was Charles W. Eliot. He was the president of Harvard University, uh, probably the single most important person in the history of American higher education. He was president of Harvard longer than anyone before or since, uh, uh, incredibly influential. He reigned for, for about four decades, and he rearranged the way Harvard educated young men. When we think of Harvard as the quintessential American research university, it's because Eliot made it that way. He's the guy who invented elective courses, who created professional schools, who eliminated compulsory worship. When Harvard did it, everybody else did it. Charles Eliot left his stamp on, on everything that happens in higher education. He also hated team sports. What bothered him most was competition and how it motivated players to conduct themselves in ways he considered unbecoming of gentlemen. If baseball and football were honorable pastimes, he reasoned, then why did they need umpires and referees? <laughs> a game that needs to be watched is not fit for a genuine sportsman, he once said. Eliot thought a pitcher who threw a curveball engaged in an act of treachery. <laughs> football distressed him even more. Eliot believed it was improper for a running back to attack the weakest part of the opposing team's line. So that the honorable, manly thing to do is to attack the strongest part of the other team's line. He liked almost nothing about football. Most of all, he despised its violence. And time and again, when you look at his writings, time and again, he calls football evil. Evil, evil, evil. So a word we don't hear in politics a lot these days, right? But Eliot is always evil, evil, evil. One of his main adversaries was Walter Camp, the guy who played in that 1876 game that Theodore Roosevelt watched. Camp was a pretty good player. He was even better as a coach and a rules maker. That's where he left his mark. He's the closest thing football has to a founding father, Walter Camp is. He invented the position of quarterback, the way the game was scored, the concepts of possession and downs and the line of scrimmage and formations. On virtually every aspect of football as it evolved in the 1880s and 1890s, Walter Camp left his mark. He was also a great salesman of the sport who wrote books and newspaper articles to promote the game and make it popular. As a journalist, he collaborated to invent the idea of the All-American. He, he had a weekly newspaper column. He shared it with a journalist, and they're running up against deadline pressure. And he was in the, he was in the position a lot of columnists find themselves in. So, you know, oh my goodness, my deadline is in six hours. I don't know what I'm going to write on. So he and this guy came up, well, let's, let's, let's make an All-American team. And so they did. And ever since, there have been All-American teams. In doing this, he helped make football not only a great game to watch and play, but also a great subject to discuss and debate when the games aren't being played. In the rivalry between Eliot and Camp, we see one of the ongoing conflicts in American politics on display. A fight between the progressives and their dreams of a world without risk and resistance to this agenda. Eliot and the progressives identified a genuine problem with football but their preferred solution was radical. They wanted to regulate football out of existence because they believed that its participants were not capable of making their own judgments about the costs and benefits of the game. Instead, they would relieve players of the burden of choosing to play or not to play. They would take away the freedom to play and ban the sport for the sake of its players. Into this struggle stepped Theodore Roosevelt, one of the most remarkable men ever to walk across the stage of American politics. As a boy, he grew up with a terrible handicap, chronic asthma. Relatives wondered if he would survive childhood. He was born in 1858. This was at a time, of course, when surviving childhood was not taken for granted. A lot of kids didn't make it. Relatives wondered if he would. His parents tried everything they could think of to, salt, to, to uh, cure his asthma. Uh, they even resorted to quack cures, such as having the poor kids smoke cigars because they thought it'd clear up his lungs. Now, eventually, his parents concluded that, Tim, uh, that, 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 that Teddy simply would have to overcome. And there's a story in Roosevelt family lore in which the father, who was Theodore Roosevelt Sr., 
summons the boy to his study. They, they were a very wealthy family in Manhattan. And uh, uh, Father Roosevelt summons the boy into, into his study and says, Theodore, you have the mind, but you have not the body. And without the help of the body, the mind cannot go as far as it should. You must make your body. And the story goes that, that, that Teddy, upon hearing this, flashes his toothy grin and, you know, and, 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 and throws back his head and says, then I'll make my body. And he was 11 years old when he said this. Well, Teddy began to exercise in a gym. Gymnasiums were just becoming popular at this time. Later on, he took boxing lessons and he hunted. And he really did make his body. The asthma would stay with him for years, but eventually it would slip away, as it does with many people. You can outgrow it, and he seems to have outgrown it. But by the time he was an adult and was largely gone, he thought he'd learned a lesson that was a, it was a commit, he thought he'd learned the lesson that, that, that a commitment to physical fitness could take a scrawny little boy and turn him into a vigorous young man. Now, as Roosevelt was, become, becoming to, was coming to believe this, he was also becoming a fan, a fan of football, as were many other Americans. Roosevelt remained a fan as he graduated from Harvard, entered politics, ranched out west, and became an increasingly visible public figure. In 1895, shortly before he became president of the New York City Police Commission, he wrote a letter to Walter Camp. It's a great letter, and I want to read about 300 words from it. I am very glad to have, have a chance of expressing to you the obligation which I feel all Americans are under to you for your championship of athletics. Roosevelt had, had a very high-pitched, kind of tinny voice. He's, we think of him as a big, kind of barrel-chested man, right? But he had this kind of high-pitched voice. People commented on it. There are, there are actually a couple of recordings of it. If you, you can Google around and find them, you can hear it a little bit. But, but that's, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best here with, with, with TR. <laughs> The man on the farm and in the workshop here, as in other countries, is apt to get enough physical work. But we were tending steadily in America to produce sedentary classes. And from this, the athletic spirit has saved us. We still complain about video games today, don't we? Right? Kids, kids are a bunch of weaklings now because they play video games, right? Of all games, I personally like football the best, and I'd rather see my boys play it than see them play any other. I have no patience with the people who declaim against it because it necessitates rough play and occasional injuries. The rough play, if confined within manly and honorable limits, is an advantage. It is a good thing to have the personal contact about which the New York Evening Post snarls so much. And no fellow is worth his salt if he minds an occasional bruise or cut. Being nearsighted, I was not able to play football in college. And I never cared for rowing or baseball. So I did all my work in boxing and wrestling. They are both good exercises, but they are not up to football. I am utterly disgusted with the attitude of President Elliott and the Harvard faculty about football. I do not give a snap for a good man who can't fight and hold his own in the world. A citizen has got to be decent, of course. That is the first requisite. But the second, and just as important, is that he shall be efficient. And he can't be efficient unless he is manly. Nothing has impressed me more in meeting college graduates during the 15 years I've been out of college than the fact that, on average, the men who have counted most have been those who had sound bodies. That sounds like a letter Roosevelt would write, doesn't it? It's quintessential Roosevelt. So he saw football as, as more than a diversion. It's more than a piece of entertainment. He saw it as a positive social good. Now, three years later, the USS Maine blew up in the harbor of Havana. Of Havana. The Spanish-American War was on. You've probably heard the popular story about Roosevelt. He's working at a desk job in Washington, D.C. He wants to go fight in this war that he knows is coming. Signs up with the Army, goes out to San Antonio, and recruits the Rough Riders. And who does he want for the Rough Riders? He wants cowboys, he wants Westerners, he wants the kinds of ranchers he met when he was in the Dakotas. Right? This is the popular legend about who the Rough Riders were. And it's basically true. That's essentially what happened. But if you read his memoirs, they're called the Rough Riders. If you read his memoirs, he says all these things. He wants cowboys, he wants ranchers and westerners and so forth. He also says he wants football players. That's the other part of the story. He wants football players with him because he thought that football would help give them the stuff it would take to win the war in Cuba. Now, the Duke of Wellington reportedly once said that the Battle of Waterloo was won on the plain fields of Eton. 
Roosevelt never said anything quite so pithy about the Battle of San Juan Hill. But when he emerged from the Spanish-American War as a national hero, a national hero possibly of presidential timber, he knew how much he owed, not just to the Rough Riders, but to the culture of manliness and risk-taking that had shaped them. Now, like Roosevelt, our society values sports, but we don't always think about why or why we should. My own kids have played football, baseball, hockey, uh, basketball, lacrosse, soccer, you name it. As a, as a family, we're, we're fairly sports-oriented. And it's forced me to think about a question that a lot of parents probably ask at one time or another, which is, why do we drive them everywhere to these practices and games every night of the week and on weekends? Why are we doing this? Why does this make sense? When you talk with other parents about this, say, what, you know, what, is, what is the value of sports? Why are we doing this for the kids? The first thing you often hear is, well, it's good for health and fitness. Right? It's the first thing you hear. And then if you scratch a little bit deeper, you, you start talking about the intangible benefits of, of, what, uh, of, 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 of building character and learning about teamwork and, 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 and these sorts of things. Now, it turns out that there really is something to all of this. Empirical research shows that kids who play sports in high school stay in school longer. They also vote more often as adults. They also make more money as adults. People who play high school sports make about 15% more income as adults. Explaining why this is true is trickier. But it probably has something to do with developing a competitive instinct and a desire for achievement. At least that's my guess. Roosevelt is probably correct in believing that sports influence the character of a nation. Americans are much more likely than Europeans to play sports. We're also more likely to attribute economic success to hard work as opposed to luck compared to Europeans. And it may be that sports are a manifestation or possibly even a source of American exceptionalism. Now, in 18 1999, shortly before he joined the presidential ticket with McKinley, in 1899, Roosevelt delivered what may be the most famous speech he ever gave. It's called The Strenuous Life. Probably, if you haven't heard it, you've probably heard of it. Soon after, he rewrote it for kids. He wrote a kid's version. It appeared in a children's magazine. He described how a boy can, quote, grow into the kind of American man of whom America can be really proud. For Roosevelt, this meant playing sports. The great growth in the love of athletic sports, he wrote, has had an excellent effect in increased manliness. He singled out the rough sports for their development of pluck, endurance, and physical fitness. And he concluded with a direct reference to what many regarded as the roughest sport of all. In short, in life, as in a football game, the principle to follow is hit the line hard, don't foul and don't shirk, but hit the line hard. That was his message to children. Soon enough, Roosevelt became one of the hardest-hitting chief executives this country's ever known. His overall political legacy is mixed, but he was unfailingly colorful. As Roosevelt presided in Washington, football remained controversial, and Harvard's Eliot continued his crusade for prohibition. In 1905, Roosevelt was persuaded to act. He invited Walter Camp of Yale to the White House, along with the coaches of Harvard and Princeton. These were the three biggest college football programs of the time. Lots changed since then, but they were the biggest of the time. Football is on trial, said Roosevelt. Because I believe in the game, I want to do all I can to save it. He encouraged the coaches to eliminate brutality, and they promised they would. Whether they really meant it is another matter. In 1905, Walter Camp didn't see anything wrong with the way football was played. He thought after spending most of his life creating it and refining it and improving it, he thought he'd gotten things just about right. And football didn't need to change. Harvard's coach, however, was a young man named Bill Reed. He took Roosevelt more seriously. As a Harvard man, Reed understood the threat to football differently. He knew that Elliott still wanted to eliminate the game, and within weeks of meeting with Roosevelt, Reed came to fear that Elliott was, in fact, on the verge of success in having Harvard drop the sport. This almost certainly would have encouraged other schools to do the same, endangering the future of football in America. Remember, what Harvard does, other schools follow. Right? They, they all want to imitate Harvard, even back then. So if Harvard drops football, a bunch of other schools will too. This, is what, this was Reed's concern. So at the end of the 1905 season, that year when 18 people died playing football, at the end of the 1905 season, Reed plotted with a 
group of reform-minded colleges to form an organization that today we know of as the NCAA. They approved a, sweat, a set of sweeping rule changes to reduce football's violence. In committee meetings, Reed outmaneuvered Walter Camp and received critical behind-the-scenes support from Theodore Roosevelt. That off-season, football underwent its extreme makeover. The yardage necessary for a first down increased from 5 to 10. The rules makers also created a neutral zone at the line of scrimmage, limited the number of players who could line up in the backfield, made the personal foul a heavily penalized infraction, and also eliminated or banned the tossing of ball carriers. <laughs> now, this was actually a problem, throwing the, the running back over the, over, the, over the line. There's a story about one guy who, who took the handles off suitcases and stitched them into the sides of his jersey so his teammates could pick him up and throw him better. Well, that became illegal. These were important revisions, but the one that would transform the sport and change it forever was the advent of the forward pass. Because up until this moment, football was a game of running and kicking, not throwing. There were quarterbacks, but not wide receivers. You could toss the ball backward, lat, you know, it's a lateral, lateral toss, but you couldn't throw it downfield. For years, a number of football men had wanted to introduce, introduce the forward pass. Among them was a guy named John Heisman, whose name you may recognize. But Walter Camp, at the rules committee he dominated, Walter Camp always stopped them. This changed after Roosevelt's intervention. Bill Reed's committee decided to permit the forward pass in order to open up the game and, and spread it across the field and create new kinds of opportunities for play. It took a few years to get the rule right. Coaches and teams didn't always know how to take advantage of, of the latest revisions in the rules. They also had to make footballs more aerodynamic because they were still shaped like watermelons that year. It took a few more years to get them fully, you know, look, looking like footballs now, things you could actually throw. And eventually, however, it all clicked. On November 1st, 1913, football moved irreversibly into the modern era. Army was one of the best teams in the country, a national championship contender. It was scheduled to play a game against a little-known Catholic school from the Midwest. <clears throat> Army wants big score, read the headline of the New York Times that morning. It was going to be a blowout, you know, like the time Michigan played Appalachian State. <laughs> you can probably guess the rest of the story. The little-known Catholic college from the Midwest was Notre Dame. Knut Rockne and his teammates launched football's first true air war, throwing again and again for receptions and touchdowns, and they won 35 to 14. The Westerners flashed the most sensational football that has been seen in the East this year, gushed the New York Times the next day. The Army players were hopelessly confused and chagrined before Notre Dame's great playing, and their style of old-fashioned, close line-smashing play was no match for the spectacular and highly perfected attack of the Indiana Collegians. A cadet named Dwight Eisenhower watched from the sidelines. He was on Army's team, but he didn't play because of injury. Everything has gone wrong, he wrote to his girlfriend. The football team got beaten most gloriously by Notre Dame. And with that game, football's long first chapter came to a close. The game that we enjoy today the American game of football that we know and love was born. Now, violence in football didn't end, but the sport solved its problem with violence and improved its quality at the same time. Few people speak of prohibiting football today. When many influential people did, however, Theodore Roosevelt stepped in and played an unheralded but critical role in the sport's development. Now, as a general rule, I think we don't want our politicians interfering with our sports. Like the only thing that could make the BCS system worse is congressional involvement. <laughs> and I'm not making this up. They have had hearings on it. But the example of Roosevelt shows that a skillful leader can use a light touch to solve a vexing problem. Now, decades after Roosevelt's involvement in football, Bill Reed, the Harvard coach, who was eventually fired because he couldn't beat Yale, Bill Reed hailed his role, hailed Roosevelt's role in all this. 
is long after Roosevelt's death. Except for this chain of events, there might now be no such thing as American football as we know it, he wrote. You ask me whether President Theodore Roosevelt helped save the game, I can tell you that he did. So Theodore Roosevelt took on many roles in American life. He was a war hero, a trust buster, a canal builder, a big stick-wielding diplomat. But one of his most important roles was as, in, as football's indispensable fan. Thank you very much. So I think we're doing questions. Yeah. Questions? Bueller? Bueller? Yeah, there's a microphone in the back. You've got to go to it, apparently. If you could elaborate a little bit more on what you said about that social aspect of the first move to Michigan Stadium, where you're walking with the other kids in other departments. You want me to walk, have a walk down memory lane here? Well, um, I'd gone to one Michigan football game before coming here as a student. My dad took me when I was like 12, and Iowa beat us that day is what I remember. Um, but, but what really impressed me is, is just the, the, that day, but then, then, then but it, you know, I kind of dimly remembered it, but, but uh, uh, as a student going to the game, just the, 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 the hugeness of it. And I, I, took, my, I took my kids to, to a Michigan game last year, first time they'd ever gone. We've been living in, in D.C. almost 20 years before we moved back. Um, over the summer, and, and we, we, we got tickets for the Ohio State game. You know, you know, <laughs> well played, Dad. That was a, that was a good one. But I, I remember they, they, they had, they, they'd been going to some, some games at Hillsdale. And Hillsdale College is a Division II school, and the football team's pretty good. Um, they mostly win. You know, it's a good team, but it's a, it's a Division II school. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like a high school game. You know, Hillsdale High School might get more people to turn out for its games than Hillsdale College. At least it's close, right? And then to see, to, to see their expressions as we walked into Michigan Stadium and think, oh my goodness, I've never seen so many people in one place. It's just an amazing thing to see. And uh, um, as, I say in, as I say in the talk, it just, you know, this is, this is more than a game. And I know, you know, I, I can't tell you what percentage of my conversations with my father involve Michigan football. You know, like, like half of what we talk about <laughs> is Michigan football, right? The other half is Jose Valverde, based on, uh, <laughs> based on, based on uh, seeing him yesterday. Um, so, so these, you know, th these games are fun, but, but they really matter. They're, they're an important part of our social and cultural lives. It's more than entertainment. What do you want people who read your book or hear your talks to take away from it? If there's just one or, or, or a few major points. I want them to buy it. <laughs> um, you know, I, <clears throat> it's, I'll tell you, it's, 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 it's a really fun story, and it was, it was, it was virtually untold. I mean, I, I stumbled on it, right? I, I, you know, when you're, a, when you're a writer, you're always looking for untold stories. And this, this one I happened upon. Remember that statistic I told you? In 1905, 18 people died playing football. I was, I was looking through a book, a history of the NCAA, just kind of flipping through it, skimming it. And I saw that statistic, and I thought, oh my, I'd never heard that before. Well, there was a footnote. I went and I looked up the footnote. And this was at a time I, my office was, was right across the street from the Library of Congress. And you know, a week later, I found myself going through old microfilms of old newspapers and so on and, and investigating this story. And they say that, uh, I, have a, I have a friend who writes books, and he says, authors write the books they want to read but cannot find. And I wanted to read a book on this period. I wanted to read a book, a book about er, football's early history, the violence, you know, what happened. But the book didn't exist. And so, uh, so I wound up writing the thing myself. Um, 
And it's just, it's, it's a really interesting story about a, a moment in time of, 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 you know, in American history and the development of American culture and the rise of sports in our country. You know, there was a time when, you know, there weren't team, everybody wasn't playing team sports and there, there was a moment when it all happened and came together and, and there was Th Theodore Roosevelt at the center of it helping, uh, helping change the game. So I hope they think it's a good story. It was a great story. I think everybody enjoyed it here. Um, a few years ago, ESPN uh, talked about some of the greatest rivalries in sport, and they talked about Michigan versus Ohio State probably being the best, even better than Ali Frazier in boxing or the Yankees and the Red Sox. Uh, one of the things I'd, I'd like to get your opinion on is what would Teddy Roosevelt say about uh, the professionalism of sports, you know, moving from Saturday games of colleges to Sunday games of professional football? That's a great question, and uh, first of all, it's impossible to know. Second of all, I think he would love the sport today. I think he would love the competition, the athleticism, and, and the vigor of it. I think he would, he would enjoy those aspects. I think he would be deeply turned off by the money, and particularly at the college level. I mean, Theodore Roosevelt was... Uh, um, he, was a, he, he came from a wealthy background. He was a little bit embarrassed by his own wealth. Um, uncomfortable with, with it in a certain way and, um, um, uh, uh, and was, was incorruptible. I mean, say what you will about Roosevelt and his politics and so forth. I mean, the man is, is, is you can never, you cannot imagine the man taking a bribe or anything like that. I mean, he's utterly incorruptible and patriotic and, and so forth. I think he'd be turned off by the money of it and, and he, would, he, would, he would possibly view, uh, he, he might see it as a scandal. But that's just pure speculation on my part. I think, he'd I think he'd fundamentally be a fan. He'd either be a Giants or a Jets fan. I'm not sure which. <laughs> and a Michigan fan, too, of course. <laughs> no, he was, actually, he was actually a big fan of Harvard, right? I mean, that was his team. And one of the jokes about um, 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 he, he would get very upset when Yale won. Y Yale won, like, all the time back then. And uh, this, this one of the jokes about Elliot was the reason why he wanted to ban football is because he could never beat Yale. <laughs> Harvard, Harvard, uh, Roosevelt took these games personally. <laughs> Anything else? One more. This is my friend, this is my friend James who's, who's running to my rescue here with questions. <laughs> well, you know, we're here at Michigan. Great winner at that time, coaching. What role, if any, did he play in this period? Less of one than I had wanted him to. In terms of the story I tell, Fielding Yost was a great figure in football, an influential figure, mattered a lot here at Michigan, of course. You can't believe how much I wanted to include Michigan in this story. And I looked and looked and looked. And it just, you know, I did manage to, if you look him up in the index, there he is. But in terms of, uh, in terms of reforming the sport and, and inventing the forward pass, just not, not there. Now, the, the, the interesting thing about um, Michigan in this period and some of the Midwestern schools, you know, or, or the Western schools as they were called, right? Champions of the West, right? That's what we were back then. Well, uh, the, 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 the East Coast schools dominated the rules committees, like, uh, you know, Walter Camp's Yale and Harvard and Princeton and Army and so forth. The East Coast schools dominated. But these football powerhouses were rising up in the West, in, in, in Michigan and Wisconsin and Chicago and so forth. And on the East Coast, they were always worried that, that the West Coast, that the, mid, that the Midwestern schools would, 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 would become more popular. You know, and they were, they were keeping an eye on the Midwest. You know, if, 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 if the Midwestern schools had invented the forward pass, you know, the Eastern schools would have seen that as a real threat. But that's, that didn't happen. I'm not that great a football fan, but I am a Michigan fan. And I'm not sure when all these different conferences started. So when you're talking about things in the early 1900s, do you know when the different conferences started and how that came about? You know, I'm not sure. There, there might be people in the room who know better than me. I do know this, that, you know, the Ivy League, we, we hear about the Ivy League all the time. The Ivy League is an athletic conference. Um, but these teams, you know, Harvard and Yale and Princeton would all play each other each year, and, and they, would, they would create sort of national championship games and, 
and so on. But I'm, 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 I'm not, I don't know. Okay, so Roosevelt saves football, and a brutal game like football continues, and uh, the, these people are our gladiators. And a young man takes a scholarship, and uh, he receives the big man on campus. Later, he might take the big stack of money for being a pro, but then decades later finds that his knees are bad, they're dying young, gets, has brain problems, and sues. So we tried to do everything medically possible for them at the time. But now, do we still owe them something or no? Good question. And litigation, the threat of litigation, actually the, the reality of litigation is what's driving a lot of this controversy and why the NFL is responding to it so much today. Um, I'll, I'll make two points. First is I, I think... Um, um, I think we need to recognize football is not a risk-free activity. Everybody who plays needs to know that. And you can, uh, you can, you can, you can think of ways to make it safer. Uh, you know, they just moved, they just moved the, you know, they're now kicking the ball off from a different spot because there are more touchbacks and there's less, there are less kick returns. And, you know, the kick return is, is a very dangerous play. Uh, because you have guys running at full speed, you know, going, get, get, getting 60 yards of, 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 of steam under them, running full speed into each other. Those are dangerous plays. Football is trying to make some modifications. But I think, I think we need, number one, to recognize that football is not a risk-free activity, and it never will be. Uh, there are hazards to it, and uh, some, of them, some of them we can see as people are playing. Some may not show up for many years, but it is not a risk-free activity. and never will be as long as it's anything like the sport we love. Number two, I've always, um, I've always refrained from making suggestions about what football should do. And I refrained from it because I never really played it myself. I, uh, uh, I was a basketball player in high school. I had a brief, glorious career as a basketball player in high school. Um, but I never played football except like in the backyard, you know, throwing the ball around, that kind of thing. I was never on a high school team or anything like that. And one of the lessons I, I, I took away from Roosevelt's involvement is that football solved its problem itself. What Roosevelt did is he summoned these coaches to the White House and he said, you guys are football men, you solve football's problem. He didn't tell them what to do. He said, you guys go solve this problem. You know better than me, you know better than people who don't play the sport. Go, this problem exists, go solve it. And they did. And my hope is today football would do the same thing. Won't make the game risk free but might be able to address some of the concerns that we're starting to have now about safety. Now, what could it do? I don't know. You hear things about helmet technology. There's a, you know, and I don't, I don't know anything about helmet technology, but you know, maybe they could make a better helmet. There's a, there's a former Michigan football player named John Wood who talks about a very specific kind of, of training that helps build neck strength, and, and he claims that, this, that, 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 if, that if players started exercising and training a little bit differently, they could become they could become more resistant to some of these injuries. You know, that sounds plausible to me. I really have no clue, but it sounds plausible to me. And uh, the most interesting example I heard is, and this would be a radical change to the sport in some ways, not as big as the, as, as the invention of the forward pass, but what if instead of having kickoffs, you always punted? Right? If, the kickoff is, if the kickoff is the most dangerous play in football because you get these guys sprinting and crashing into each other, what if you punted? Um, it might, it might reduce some of the violence of this play and still retain an important kicking element to the game. You'd still have special teams. But so instead of, instead of place kick, you know, guys, guys who kick off at the start of the, of the uh, game and at the start of the half and after scoring and so forth, what if they punted? It might be a safer, might be a safer play. But there you go, food for thought. Anything else? All righty. Folks, thanks very much. Go Blue. Thank you so much. I know I learned a lot, and this is food for thought, so what a, what a nice way to end this. John, we have a special gift for you, which is a pen set with the signatures, if I can open it, uh, from Gerald R. Gerald R. Ford. So you have for future book signings, and if people brought books tonight, I'm quite sure that John will be happy to That's sign. Great. 
So that's for you. Thank you. And thank you so much for coming. My, my Michigan jersey is number 48. Now, everybody else, everybody else in my family is 16. You know, they're all, they're all about Denard, right? But I got 48, so thank, thank you. We have upcoming programs of interest. One is on the, the last great Senate, which was in the 60s and 70s. It's a book by Ira Shapiro. That's coming up on October 25th. That's next week. And right after the election, we have a book, uh, a speaker call, on, uh, writing a book on the, vic the Victory Lab, The Secret Science of Winning Campaigns. Now, this is after we all will have voted. And Sasha Isenberg will be here to tell us that all of the polling agencies knew how we would vote before we vote. So do uh, come to those, and you'll have a chance to meet our speaker in the lobby. And if you're not a friend of Ford or on our uh, email lists for information about programs, please sign up. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you.